This one is called Thumbelisa by Hans Christian Andersen. In this story, we find the feminine counterpart of Tom Thumb. Thumbelisa also travels and has adventures, but only such suitable to a heroine, not a hero. Here, Anderson is less satirical and less, certainly less biting than he is in many of his other stories. And the ending is just the sort that all children approve. From Belisa, Hans Christian Andersen. There was once a woman who had the greatest longing for a tiny little child, but she, I gotta turn the pages real careful, but she had no idea where to get one. I mean, I can tell you, I, never mind. So she went to the old witch and said to her, I do so long to have a little child. Will you tell me where I can get one? Oh, we shall be able to manage that, said the witch. Here is a barley corn for you. It is not at all the same kind as that which grows in the peasant's field or with which chickens are fed. Plant it in a flower pot and you will see what will appear. Oh, thank you, thank you, said the woman. And she gave the witch twelve pennies, then went home and planted the barley corn, and a large, handsome flower sprang up at once. It looked exactly like a tulip, but the petals were slightly shut up, just as if they were still in a bud. That is a lovely flower said the woman and she kissed the pretty red and yellow petals as she kissed it the flower burst open with a loud snap it was a real tulip you could see that but right in the middle of the flower on the green stool sat a little tiny girl most lovely and delicate she was not more than an inch in height, so she was called Thumbelisa. Hello, um, um, mutt on all. Hello, welcome in. Her cradle was a smartly varnished walnut shell with the blue petals of violet for mattress and rose leaf to cover her. She slept in it at night, but during the day she played about on the table where the woman had placed a plate, surrounded by a wreath of flowers on the outer edge, with their stalks in water. A large tulip petal floated on the water, and on this little Thumbelisa sat and sailed about from one side of the plate to the other. She had two white horses. I'm sorry, she had two white horse hairs for oars. It was a pretty sight. She could sing, too, with such delicacy and charm as was never heard before. One night, she lay in her pretty bed a great ugly toad hopped in at the window, for there was a broken pane. Ugh, how hideous was that great wet toad. It hopped right down onto the table where Thumbelisa lay fast asleep under the red rose leaf. Here is a lovely wife for my son said the toad. And then she took up the walnut shell where Thumbelisa slept and hopped away with it through the window down to the garden. A great broad stream ran through it, and just at the edge of it was, uh, was swampy and muddy. 
and it was here that the toad lived with her son. Uh, how ugly and hideous he was, too, exactly like his mother. Coax, coax, brackle, cackle, cax. That was all he had to say when he saw the lovely little girl in the walnut shell. Do not talk too loud, or you will wake her, said the old toad. She might escape us yet, for she is as light as thistle down. We will put her on one of the broad water lilies. Lily leaves out in the stream. It will be just like an island to her. She is so small and light. She won't be able to run away from there. While we get to stateroom, while we get the stateroom ready under the mud, which you are to inhabit. A great many water lilies grew in the stream, and their broad green leaves looked as if they were floating on the surface of the water. The leaf which was the furthest from the shore, was also the biggest. And to this one, the old toad swam out with the walnut shell in which little Thumbelisa lay. The poor, tiny little creature woke up quite early in the morning, and when she saw where she was, she began to cry most bitterly. For there was water on every side of a big green leaf, and she could not reach land at any point. The old toad sat in the mud, decking out her abode with grasses and buds of yellow water lilies, so as to have it very nice for the new daughter-in-law. But then she swam out with her ugly son to the leaf where Thumbelisa stood. They wanted to fetch her pretty bed to place it in the bridal chamber in the bridal chamber before they took her there. The old toad made a deep curtsy in the water before her and said, Here is my son, who is to be your husband, and you are to live together most comfortably down in the mud. Coax, coax, brackle, kick. That was all the sun could say. Hey, Limit. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, the question has been asked, um, Thumbelisa, you're probably familiar with Thumbelina, I was too, but Thumbelisa is a different, I don't know, maybe it's the same, but it's just, I don't know, translated differently, who knows. <laughs> okay. Then they took the pretty little bed and swam away with it. But Thumbelisa sat quite alone on the green leaf and cried because she did not want to live with the ugly toad or have her horrid son for a husband. The little fish, which swam about in the water, had no doubt seen the toad and heard what she said. So they stuck their heads up, wishing, I suppose, to see the little girl. As soon as they saw her, they were delighted with her, and were quite, quite grieved to think that she was to go down to live with the ugly toad. We're talking about the fish. 
No, that should never happen. They flocked together down in the water. Round about the green stem which held the leaf, she stood upon and gnawed at it with their teeth until it floated away down the stream, carrying Thumbelisa away where the toad could not follow her. Hey, name was Thumbelisa sailed past palace. I'm sorry, not palace. I'm trying it. Thumbelisa sailed past place after place, and the little birds in the bushes saw her and sang, What a lovely little maid! The leaf with her on it floated further and further away, and in this manner reached foreign lands. A pretty little white butterfly fluttered round and round her for some time, and at last settled on the leaf, for it had taken quite a fancy to Thumbelisa. She was so happy now, because the toad could not reach her, and she was sailing through such lovely scenes. The sun shone on the water and it looked like liquid gold. Then she took her sash and tied one end round the butterfly, and the other end she made fast to the leaf, which went gliding on quicker and quicker, and she with it, for she was standing on the leaf. Oh, Lily is tired. Am I making you tired or sleepy or both? At this moment, a big cockchafer came flying along. What's a cockchafer? is a large brown European beetle that flies at dusk and crashes into lighted windows. Okay, so it's like... It's like a beetle. Alright, now that we got it. At this moment, a big cockchafer came flying along. He caught sight of her, and in an instant, he fixed his claw around her slender waist and flew off with her up into a tree. But the green leaf floated down the stream, and the butterfly with it, for he was tied to it and could not get loose. Heavens, how frightened! Poor little Thumbelisa was when the cockchafer carried her up into the tree, but she was most of all grieved about the pretty white butterfly which she had fastened to the leaf. If he could not succeed in getting loose, he would be starved to death. <laughs> Brantley, hello. Good to see you. But the cockchafer cared nothing for that. He settled with her on the largest leaf of the tree and fed her with honey from the flowers. And he said that she was lovely, although she did not a bit, she did not a bit like a shaver. Although what? Although she was not a bit like a shaver. They wrote sentences in a very strange way back then. Okay. Presently, all the other Schaefers which lived in the tree came to visit them. They looked at Thumbelisa, and the young lady Schaefers twitched their feelers and said, She has got two legs, 
what good effect it has. She has no feelers, said another. She is so slender in the waist. Fie, she looks like a human being. How ugly she is, said all the mother shavers, and yet little Thumbelisa was so pretty. That was certainly also the opinion of the cockchafer who had captured her. But when all the others said she was ugly, he at least began to believe it too, and he would not have anything more to do with her. She might go wherever she liked. They flew down from the tree with her and placed her on a daisy, where she cried because she was so ugly that the Schaefers would have nothing to do with her, and after all she was more beautiful than anything you could imagine, as delicate and transparent as the finest rose leaf. Poor little Thumbelisa lived all the summer quite alone in the wood. She plaited a bed of grass for herself and hung it up under a big dock leaf which sheltered her from the rain. She sucked the honey from the flowers for her food, and her drink was the dew which lay on the leaves in the morning. In this way the summer and autumn passed, but then came the winter. All the birds which used to sing so sweetly to her flew away. The great dock leaf under which she had laid under which she had lived, shriveled up, leaving nothing but dead yellow stalk, and she shivered with the cold, for her clothes were worn out. She was such a tiny creature, poor little Thumbelisa. She certainly must be frozen to death. It began to snow, and every snowflake which fell upon her was like a whole shovel upon one of us, for we are big, and she was only one inch in height. Hello, Sean. Hello. Then she wrapped herself up in a withered leaf, but that did not warm her much. She trembled with the cold. Close to the wood in which she had been laying lay a large cornfield, but the corn had long ago been carried away, and nothing remained but bare dry stubble which stood out from the frozen ground. The stubble was quite a forest for her to walk about in. Oh, how she shook with the cold. Then she came to the door of the field mouse's home. It was a little hole down under the stubble. The field mouse lived so cozily and warm there. Her whole room was full of corn, and she had a beautiful kitchen and larder besides. Poor Thumbelisa stood just inside the door, like any other poor beggar child, and begged for a little piece of barley corn, for she had nothing to eat for two whole days. For two whole days. said the field mouse, for she was at the bottom of a good old field mouse. Come into my warm room and dine with me. Then as she took a fancy to Thumbelisa, she said, you may with pleasure stay with me for the winter, but you must keep my room clean and tidy, and tell me stories for I am very fond of them. And Thumbelisa did what the good field mouse desired, and was on a whole very comfortable. 
Hey Ross, good to see you. Sean, if you want to use the time command, do time zone. Do exclamation time zone and then type Cape Town. See if that works. Now, we shall soon have a visitor, said the field mouse. My neighbor generally comes to see me every weekday. He is even better housed than I am. His rooms are very large and he wears a most beautiful black velvet coat. If only you could get him for a husband, you would indeed be well settled. But he can't see. You must tell him all the most beautiful stories you know. Thumbelisa did not like this. And she would have nothing to say to the neighbor, for he was a mole. He came and paid a visit in his black velvet coat. He was very rich and wise, said the field mouse, and his home was twenty times as large as hers, and he had much learning, but did not like the sun or the beautiful flowers. In fact, he spoke slightingly of them, for he had never seen them. Thumbelisa had to sing to him, and she sang both Fly Away Cockshuffer and A Monk He Wandered Through the Meadow. Then the mole fell in love with her because of her sweet voice, but he did not say anything, for he was of discreet turn of mind. He had just made a long tunnel through the ground from his house to theirs and he gave the field mouse and Thumbelisa leave to walk in it whenever they liked. He told them not to be afraid of the dead bird which was lying in the passage. It was a whole bird with feathers and beak which had probably died quite recently at the beginning of winter and was now entombed just where he had made his tunnel. The mole took a piece of tender wood in his mouth, for that shines like fire in the dark, and walked in front of them to light them in the long dark passage. When they came to the place where the dead bird lay, the mole thrust his broad nose up to the roof and pushed the earth up so as to make a big hole through which the daylight shone. In the middle of the floor was a dead swallow, with its pretty wings closely pressed to its sides, and its legs and head were drawn under the feathers. No doubt the poor bird had died of the cold. Thumbelisa was so sorry for it. She loved all the little birds, for they had twittered and sung so sweetly to her during the whole summer. But the mole kicked it with his short legs and said, Now it will pipe no more. It must be a miserable fate to be born a little bird. Thank heaven no child of mine can be a bird. A bird like that has nothing but its twitter and dies of hunger in the winter. Yes, as a sensible man, you may as well say that, said the field mouse. What has a bird for all its twittering when the cold weather comes? It has to hunger and freeze, but then it must cut a dash. Thumbelisa did not say anything, 
But when the others turned their backs to the bird, she stooped down and stroked aside the feathers which lay over its head, and kissed its closed eyes. Perhaps it was this very bird which sang so sweetly to me in the summer, she thought. What pleasure it gave me, the dear pretty bird. The mole now closed up the hole which let the daylight in conducted the ladies to their homes. Thumbelisa could not sleep at all in the night, so she got up out of her bed and plaited a large handsome mat of hay, and then she carried it down and spread it over the dead bird and laid some soft cotton wool which she had found in the field mouse's room close round its sides so that it might have a warm bed in the cold. Goodbye, you sweet little bird, she said. Goodbye, and thank you for your sweet song through the summer, when all the trees were green and the sun shone warmly upon us. Then she laid her head close up to the bird's breast, but was quite startled at a sound, as if something was thumping inside it. It was the bird's heart. It was not dead, but lay in a swoon, and now it had been warmed, it began to revive. In the autumn, all the swallows fly away to warm countries, but if one happens to be belated, it feels the cold so much that it falls down like a dead thing and remains lying where it falls till the snow covers it up. Thumbelisa quite shook with fright, for the bird was very, very big beside her, who was only an inch in height. But she gathered up her courage, packed the wool closer around the poor bird, and fetched a leaf of mint which she had herself for a coverlet, and laid it over the bird's head. The next night, she stole down again to it, and found it alive, but so feeble that it could only just open its eyes for a moment to look at Thumbelisa, who stood with a bit of tender wood in her hand, for she had no other lantern. Hello, Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid, man, ASMR. Hello. What are we reading? We are reading the Anthology of Children's Literature. And this is Thumbelisa by Hans Christian Andersen, I think. What? Yeah. Many, many thanks to you, my sweet child, said the sick swallow to her. You have warmed me beautifully. I shall soon have the strength to fly out in the warm sun again. Oh, she said, it is so cold outside. It snows and freezes. Stay in your warm bed. I will tend you. Then she brought water to the swallow in a leaf, and when it had drunk some, it told her how it had torn its wing on a black thorn bush, and therefore could not fly as fast as the other swallows, which were taking flight then for a distant warm lands. At last it fell down to the ground, but after that it remembered nothing, and did not in the least know how it had got into the tunnel. It stayed there all the winter, and Thumbelisa was good to it, and grew very fond of it. She did not tell either the mole or the field mouse anything about it, for they did not like the poor unfortunate swallow.
As soon as the spring came and the warmth of the sun penetrated the ground, the swallow said goodbye to Thumbelisa, who opened the hole which the mole had made above. The sun streamed in deliciously upon them, and the swallow asked if she could not go with him. She could sit on his back, and they would fly far away into the green wood. But Thumbelisa knew that it would grieve the old field mouse if she left her like that. No, I can't, said Thumbelisa. Goodbye, goodbye then, you kind pretty girl, said the swallow, and flew out into the sunshine. Thumbelisa looked after him with her eyes filled with tears, for she was very fond of the poor swallow. Tweet, tweet, said the bird, and flew into the green wood. Maybe more like tweet, 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 tweet. Thumbelisa was very sad. She was not allowed to go out into the warm sunshine at all. The corn, which was sown in the field near the field mouse's house, grew quite long. It was a thick forest for the poor little girl who was only an inch high. You must work at your trousseau this summer, said the mouse to her for their neighbor, the tiresome mole in his black velvet coat, had asked her to marry him. You shall have both woolen and linen. You shall have wherewith the clothes to cover yourself when you become the mole's wife. Thumbelisa had to turn the distaff, and the field mouse hired four spiders to spin and weave day and night. The mole paid a visit every evening, and he was always saying that when the summer came to an end, the sun would not shine nearly so warmly. Now it burnt the ground as hard as stone. Yes, when the summer was over, he would celebrate his marriage, but Thumbelisa was not pleased at all. for she did not care a bit for the tiresome mole. Every morning at sunrise and every evening at sunset, she used to steal out the door, and when the wind blew aside the tops of the cornstalks so that she could see the blue sky, she thought how bright and lovely it was out there, and wished so much to see the dear swallow again, but it never came back. No doubt it was a long way off, flying about in the beautiful green wood. When the autumn came, all Thumbelisa's outfit was ready. In four weeks you must be married, said the field mouse to her. But Thumbelisa cried and said she would not have the tiresome mole for a husband. So they were to be married. The mole had to come fetch Thumbelisa. She was to live deep down under the ground with him and never to go out into the warm sunshine, for he could not bear it. The poor child was very sad at the thought of the bidding goodbye to the beautiful sun, whilst she had been with the what? Whilst she had been with the okay. 
field mouse. Two pages stuck together. While she had been with the field mouse, at least been allowed to look at it from the door. Goodbye, you bright sun, she said as she stretched out her arms toward it and went a little way outside the field mouse's house. For now the harvest was never over. I'm sorry, for now the harvest was over and only the stubble remained. Goodbye, goodbye, she said and threw her tiny arms around a little red flower growing there. Give my love to the dear swallow if you happen to see him. Tweet, tweet. She heard at this moment above her head. She looked up and it was the swallow just passing. As soon as it saw Thumbelisa it was delighted. She told it how unwilling she was to have the ugly mole for a husband and that she was to live deep down underground where she would, where the sun was never shone. She could not help crying about it. The cold winter is coming, said the swallow, and I am going to fly away to warm countries. Will you go with me? You can sit upon my back. Tie yourself on, tie yourself on with your sash. Then we will fly away from the ugly mole and his dark cavern, far away over the mountains, to those warm countries where the sun shines with greater splendor than here, where it is always summer, and there are heaps of flowers. Do fly with me, you little sweet Thumbelisa, who saved my life where I lay frozen in the dark, earthy passage. Yes, I will go with you, said Thumbelisa, seating herself on the bird's back with her feet upon its outspread wing. I am putting this here. Oh my goodness me. She tied her band tightly to one of the strongest feathers, and then the swallow flew away high up in the air above the forest and lakes and high up above the biggest mountains where the snow never melts, and Thumbelisa shivered in the cold air, but then she crept under the bird's warm feathers and only stuck out her little head to look at the beautiful sights beneath her. Then at last they reached the warm countries. The sun shone with a warmer glow than here. The sky was twice as high, and the most beautiful green and blue grapes grew in the clusters on the banks of the hedge groves. Oranges and lemons hung in the woods, which were fragrant with myrtles and sweet herbs, and beautiful children ran about the roads playing with the large, gorgeously colored butterflies. But the swallow flew on and on, and the country grew more and more beautiful. Under magnificent green trees on the shores of the blue sea stood a dazzling white marble palace of ancient date. Vines wreathed themselves round the stately pillars, at the head of these were countless nests, and the swallow who carried Thumbelisa lived in one of them. Here is my house, said the swallow, but if you will close one of the gorgeous flowers growing down there, I will place you on it, and you will live as happily as you can wish. That would be delightful, she said and clapped her little hands. <clears throat> A great white marble column 
had fallen to the ground and lay there broken in three pieces, but between these the most lovely white flowers grew. The swallow flew down with Thumbelisa and put her upon one of the broad leaves. What was her astonishment to find a little man in the middle of the flower, as bright and transparent as if he had been made of glass. He had a lovely golden crown upon his head and the most beautiful bright wings upon his shoulders. He was no bigger than Thumbelisa. He was the angel of the flowers. There was a similar little man or woman in every flower, and he was the king of them all. Heavens, how beautiful he is, whispered Thumbelisa to the swallow. The little prince was quite frightened by the swallow, for it was a perfect giant of a bird to him, who was so small and delicate. But when he saw Thumbelisa, he was delighted. She was the very prettiest girl he had ever seen. He therefore took the crown off his head and placed it on hers and asked her name, and if she would be his wife, and then she would be the queen of the flowers. War cry mango. Hello. Very long. If this long reading was on YouTube and listen every night. Oh, for real? Maybe so. Maybe I'll do that. Yes, he was certainly a very different kind of husband from the toad son or the mole with his black velvet coat. So she accepted the beautiful prince, and out of every flower stepped a little lady or gentleman so lovely it was a pleasure to look at them. Each one brought a gift to Thumbelisa, but the best of all was a pair of pretty wings from a large white fly they fastened to her back, and then she could, too, fly from flower to flower. All was then delighted with happiness, but the swallow sat alone in his nest and sang to them as well as he could, for his heart was very heavy. He was so fond of Thumbelisa himself, and would have wished never to part from her. You shall not be called Thumbelisa, said the angel of the flower to her. That is such an ugly name, and you are so pretty. We will call you May. Goodbye, goodbye, said the swallow, and flew away again from the warm countries far away back to Denmark. There he had a little nest above the window where the man lived who wrote this story, and he sang his tweet tweet to the man. So we have the whole story. The end. This has been Thumbelisa by Hans Christian Andersen, and read for you by Bowman Dean.